So, welcome to uh, Brand Rounds number one of the Presbyon Club. Actually, I, uh, we did have a, a sort of miniature test run of the Presbyon Club Grand Rounds uh, a couple of weeks ago, as you probably see on the Facebook feed, uh, in Spanish. Uh, so those of you who want to learn Spanish or uh, check out my skills, my multilingual skills, uh, you can go on there. We, we, we spent a good couple of hours uh, talking about all these different aspects of Presbyond, um, and uh, it was actually really great. We had a, we had a wonderful time. So today, um, I hope to do the same thing. And the, the idea here, again, just to reiterate this, but of course it's been in the emails and everything, the, the idea behind this club is essentially it's a support structure um, so that those of, because everyone here basically has taken the course or they are very experienced in Presbyond because uh, they were using it before we even te taught the course. And the idea here is that we have a forum for, well, you can post online on Facebook yourselves and ask questions as people have already. Um, or we can have, we're, we're intending to do these grand rounds once a month. And the idea, therefore, is that you'll, you'll be practicing, you'll have a case that's a bit weird and somebody's got a bit of cross blur or whatever. You're going to fill out the template, which, which we've set up a PowerPoint template, and you're going to submit that, and we're going to go over and discuss the case uh, for everyone's benefit like a grand rounds <laughs> which uh, you know we don't get those uh, anymore since we were at medical school but here we are so um is there anything that anyone would like to kick off here with in terms of um content or discussion um because failing that i will fill the space as you know i'm very good at talking non-stop so uh, i'm happy to fill it in I hear silence. I don't know. Did you get the email I sent you? It's Christian speaking from Trust. Yes, Christian. Um, uh, from Dr. Travel, uh, Travel Myers. Uh, um, press beyond case. There is not the, the patient on the far eye with 1.2. He's not that happy yet. Travel Meyer. Um, when did you send it? Uh, yesterday. Yeah, from what email? Five. From you? Yeah, yeah, from my email. There you are. Okay, great. So I've got the email here. I'll just pop the email up for everybody to see. And that's great. That's a good start. So here we are. Um, I just uh, make this. Can everyone see this? I'll just zoom it up a bit. Everyone see this? Yep. Okay. okay, so, um, ah, wait, is that not all of the information? Uh, and, and then you've got uh, pictures of the diagnostic equipment you've got uh, attached in it. Ah, so there's more to it. Uh, okay, here. But the one before I had the attachment, I didn't want to... Ah, here are the pictures. And then... Oh, so this is the same email. Okay, good. The first, uh, the last one I sent you because I forgot the pre, uh, pre, uh, pre op data. Got it, got it. So the pre op data is um, this was June of 19. So yes. that's a year and a half ago. Okay, so better than 2020 uh, in each eye uh, to start with, and it was a plus one ish OD strongly dominant, whole rifle in test. Um, and um, forget about that, and then you right, go so, to the post <laughs> uh, I have one case. Uh, this is it, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, post op day one, 2020 J5 and 20, what is that? 60 J3. Hang on a second. Point, point four. So there was one eye that was seeing not well at distance and not well at near? No, these are, so this, uh, the OD is the far eye, and uh, OS is the uh, uh, for, uh, for reading. Four, yep. 
and uh, reading, he sees Jaeger 3. Oh, Jaeger 3, J3. Okay, that's quite small. Okay, good. Right. And then on the 19th now in February, he's uh, uh, uncorrected visual acuity 1.2. Yep. So he's, he's actually very happy overall, okay? The only, the only thing that comes out is that he's, uh, in daytime, he uses glasses for driving, not at night. Uh, and the glasses if, uh, that he's using is a half a, half a diopter sphere and a quarter cylinder at 152. If you look at his uh, PCVA, uh, he's got 1.2 and he has got, uh, he shows a half a diopter cylinder at 90. Hang on a sec. Minus one sphere zero cylinder yeah and the target I'm perfectly happy with that's the that's the reading eye it's spot on okay. he's happy. and the but now the distance eye is mine is minus a quarter minus a quarter that is the glasses that he's wearing for drawing uh for driving yeah but why who prescribed them uh, optometrist most probably why is he minus a quarter minus a quarter He's not happy with that eye, how he was seeing. Yeah, but what's his refraction? His refraction is here uh, under the 19th of February. You got the huh? OD. There's no refraction here. Uh, uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Plano, Plano minus 0.5 at 90. Okay. 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 Well, okay. Well, that, okay. Well, that, that's a classic. I mean, apart from, I'm just looking at the surface here. That's a classic situation where it, it quite commonly someone will not be satisfied with their distance vision because of a tiny bit of myopia in the dominant eye. And it also sometimes uncouples them for, uh, it makes, it creates cross blur. So the test you do is you have the patient sitting there, you get your minus a half sill loose lens, and you say to the patient, I've got video of this, but um, in fact, Tim, if you can pull up that video, I could probably play it. But you know, you say to the patient, which eye is blurred? And they say my left eye. And you go, okay. You put that half sill in the right eye, and then you say, is the left eye still blurred? And they go, no, this feels fine now. So by changing that half cell in the, in the dominant eye, the cross blur from the blurred left eye disappears. In other words, it's the hanging on to the ledge analogy that I like to use. If you don't have the dominant eye with your fingers on the ledge, then the brain is kind of like trying to grasp for a distance vision with one or the other eye, and neither is able to grasp you pop the dominant eye onto the ledge and suddenly he can let go of the other hand and, and hang there as long as you like. So, so if the patient is unhappy, you need to test whether the small correction in that eye makes a difference. And if it does, I mean, these glasses are technically doing that, although the axis is different, so I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, but technically, in your clinic, what you need to do is you need to test that. Okay, if it's really like that. And then could you just uh, uh, enhance that to half a, half a diopter of seal? Well, of course. Mm -hmm. But you, I mean, <laughs> hold on. And so this is getting to part one of the Presbyon course, which we realized after a while we had to teach, which was you have to be able to do LASIK like a pro. If you're someone who is not comfortable doing a tiny little enhancement, you're not going to have as many happy presbyon patients as someone who is comfortable doing small enhancements. Dr. Tribermeyer was just trying to make sure if it really will it also make then will it make him happy if he does that after the after. Well, I just told you if you test it, then you've proven to yourself it'll make him happy, right? Okay. I mean, is that's not rocket science, right? 
If you yeah, put the lens in front and he's happy, well, then doing the enhancement is going to make him happy. Okay, happy. Yeah. But, you, you know, the point is you've got to test what you're going to do before you do it. Mm. Uh, I'm looking here at his um, other maps that you put, 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 put in here. I mean, obviously, this, this kind of overview Pentacam, uh, now it's uh, stuck here trying to read that PDF. Um, there. Uh, so the epithelial profile looks pretty, pretty smooth to me. PSF looks fine. Um, uh, so we're looking here at the wave front and we're looking at the Z4 comma zero. It's minus 0 0.5, 0 0.15. That's fine. Mm -hmm. We're looking at, that's the corneal, by the way. So the lens is going to have yeah, some inside yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so we're, yeah, I mean, I, 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 obviously this map is kind of next to useless because it doesn't really have any information for Presbyond. Um, but uh, these, you know, if I look, I look at the epithelial thickness profile to tell me if there's any subsurface irregularities, and this looks pretty, pretty, pretty regular. Okay. So, so that looks fine to me. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it's interesting that where is uh, Dr. Trevelmeyer? He's not, on, he's not online today. Uh, no, he's never joined Facebook, so that's why I said I will do this. But he can do it through Face. He can do it through Zoom. Yeah. You don't have to be. You don't have to be part of uh, Facebook to join this thing, right? I will let him know. I, okay. I'm, I'm sure he will join you next time. Okay. But I think, I think that's a simple example of, of, of what we always talk about, which is that it's the same as with clear lens exchange and multifocal lenses. If you want to really get the best results, you have to be on target. So, for example, a patient who's, who's, who's plano minus 0.5 in, in, in both eyes with a trifocal in might complain. And they might complain because the constructive and destructive interference patterns that are deliberately programmed into that fine vision or the Zeiss trifocal or the panoptics, all of these lenses have construction destructive interference pattern analysis that if parallel light is going through that lens, then it will cancel out some of the halo. If you, if you have a refractive error, then that clever optics of the IOL don't work and you have the extra halo. That's why, by the way, if you look at the studies, that's why the panoptics has less halo than the symphony for example, because it has this, uh, and, and the same the same goes for the, for the Zeiss trifocal. It has this kind of um, noise reduction system, but it only works if the light is coming in at the right vergence to the eye well. Um, it has to be a plane of vergence. But good question. One more question to it. Tim, 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 have you found the video of that thing? I'm just checking the, the different videos. Okay. To make sure. so we have an exact. Which one is it? It's the one where um, uh, uh, there's a. Well, they're all. It's basically where you 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 um, the the dominant eye has to be on target, and that the cross blur goes away when you fix the dominant eye. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's this one. Okay. Great. Do so you want to so. crack that to me, or 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 or? Uh, um... uh, I'll just play it. Right. Oh, oh, you could play it. Okay, good idea. Yeah. So I'll multiple participant. Okay. Okay. Uh, share sound. Okay. See if this works. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, so That's the guy. Is undercorrected in the right eye, which is non-dominant, and slightly overcorrected in the dominant eye. So you have this sensation. Explain how that feels on the on the right hand side. Well, as it stands at the moment, without the lens in the eye, um, long distance is blurred. Um, the facial recognition is, is um, distorted. And, and on the right side, you on the right side, it, you, you you mentioned that you felt it was like it's it's like when I put the lens in. It, no, without the lens. Without the lens, it just feels as though it's blurry on the right side. Um, yeah, that's very now, when you put the lens in the left eye, I put the lens in the left to eye. the right side, 
Well, first of all, the, the image becomes a lot clearer. Yeah. And this is like that there's a curtain or a shutter come away from the right eye. Exactly. So, but when I take it away, it feels then it goes blurry straight away. It's, it's like something just goes across your eye. Okay, so you see that. He has, go back to the refraction that I showed at the beginning of the video, Tim. He is minus 0 0.3. He is minus 0. Hold on, let me, let me mute everybody. He is minus 0 0.375. In his left eye. Oh, minus 0.5. Minus 0.5 in his left eye. Okay? And it's still 2020, but it's a blurry 2020 because with that refraction, he's 2012. Okay? So now let's go back to the other eye, is minus 1, minus 0.75, the, the, the dominant, the, the non dominant eye, which is about minus, you know, 1.375 spherical equivalent. And He's got N6, you know, J3, not perfect, but, you know. The thing is, he's complaining of blur on his right-hand side with 2050 vision, which is surprising because 2050 is easy to fuse. But it's only easy to fuse if the vision is clear on the other side. And not, look, this phenomenon is not everywhere. This only happens in some patients. There are many patients who are exactly the same and have no symptoms. Okay, so we get that. We do get that. But in someone who's complaining of cross blur, first you need to see is the non-dominant eye too much minus, or is the distance vision of the non-dominant eye less than you'd expect for the minus 150 that you get on target, right? Because the depth of field, you know, a minus 150 eye is usually 2080 or 2100 in the general population. But with blended vision, the minus 150 is 2060. So are they over minus and therefore have too much blur in that side? No. Are they on target? Yes. Is their vision 20, 100, despite being on target, therefore the depth of field isn't sufficient. No. The distance vision is 2060 and they're on target. Okay, let's move to the dominant eye. The dominant eye might be plus a half, and you may not have found the plus a half because you didn't push for it. And I see that all the time. I, I, I will see that where, where, um, uh, all the time in these rare cases, sorry, I don't want to make it sound like I, that's every patient. In these rare cases, that is one. So I have, I have highly trained optometrists here who are amazingly accurate at refraction. We showed you in the course, we published our refractions. Um, you know, um, uh, one other clinic has, has done a publication in refraction this year uh, in refractive surgery, very few. But sometimes this is missed. And so one of the things that I'll test when the patient's on my chair is I'll put the 150 in, force them to look down the chart so they're kind of disaccommodating, disaccommodating, disaccommodating. I leave them there for about a minute trying to read down the chart. Can you see any more? Can you see any more? I'm forcing them. What I'm really doing is waiting for them to disaccommodate. Even a 53-year-old has some accommodation, remember? And then I, then I, if they see 2050, or 2030 through the plus 150, I immediately know that they're under plus in that eye from the refraction that came from the optometrist, which was supposed to be plus a quarter. And now I add the number of lines to get them to 2060. So that if I had 2030 through the plus 150, I need to add another a quarter to go to 2040, a quarter to go to 2050, and another quarter to go to 2060. So I had three quarters, then I take the plus 150 off. And like a magic trick, they're reading 2016. Okay, 
then you get your loose lens test. Then you grab, then you grab your your loose plus 0.75, and you say to them, look at the chart. Okay, which eye is blurred? And they go the left. Left. And you go okay. And they, and then you say you put this in front of the right, and you say which one's blurred. Oh, it's gone. It looks good. So correcting the distance eye eliminates the cross blur. So this particular case is identical, but for a quarter, to the video that Tim just showed. Yeah, this is the thing that I'll, I'll iterate again. You know, LASIK. Sorry, Presbyond is for expert LASIK surgeons. And, and, you know, you're all expert LASIK surgeons, but, you know, not everyone can do press beyond, or put it this way, not everyone's going to get as many happy patients. So we have 97% very happy patients. We have 3% that are not fully adapted at one year, and we can't really fix them because they're on target. And so what we can do is reduce the anisometropia and go through all these other iterations. But this is an incredibly successful treatment if you're good at getting people on target. And that's the, that's the, it's the, that's the clincher is that you have to be comfortable lifting a flap for a minus 0.5 sill. You have to be comfortable um, with managing the little bit of ingrowth that you're going to get at the one week mark with the washout and look at it the next day and come back a week later. Uh, oh, you know, I'm not going to wash this out again. I'm going to put a couple of YAG spots there and I'm going to weld it down, weld it down. I'm going to use, you know what? I'm going to use a little bit higher energy because I'm going to get this thing to you know, really melt down or, you know, you can, I'm going to put in 1.2 to get that thing to really burn in. Or I'm going to put in 0.8 because I just want to create a little bit of aggravation to get the macrophages to come and take the cells out themselves. You know, all of this expert stuff is how you get your super happy patients. And, you know, the honest truth is that those who get superb results with uh, clear lens exchange and multifocals, they also have to be as obsessional about everything in that surgery. Now, the people who have who are not obsessional and have happy patients, it's very simple. Those are the ones who under promise from what is possible. So if you just sh if the patient comes in and you show the 2040 at the bottom and they read it and you say, you read the bottom line. That then th that's another way of making patients happy is to fake them out, you know. But then if you do that, you haven't got refractions. If you haven't got refractions, you haven't got a nomogram. If you haven't got a nomogram, you can't get great results. So it just pays to be, you know, honest and, and good and, and, and just learn how to spend a little extra time with uh, surgeons on expert LASIK technique, you know. I don't like managing in growth. No one does. But it's totally manageable. I mean, it really is totally manageable. The probability that you will need to take the patient to the OR and suture is only 1%. That's pretty low. Especially when you consider that a lot of clear lens exchange surgeons say it's, it, it, that it is acceptable to do a, an IOL exchange in 1%. I'd rather do a, a, put two little interrupted sutures at the end of the flap in 1% than to have to dial a lens out and then put another one in. I think that's a lot more work than a couple of sutures. So, you know, so there's another question. Do you have any recommendation or patient selection criteria for patients who are already post-LASIK or post-cataract and are interested in presbyon? It's funny, that question's coming up a lot recently, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's coming up a lot because we, we never really talked about it a lot in the earlier years, uh, even though we, we knew the answer. Um, um, you know what, I'm going to pull up, I'm going to pull up, the talk, which some of you will not have seen because it was introduced later into the course. And um, I'll pull this up here. Uh, 20. 
because it has these examples. And so just this, the headline is that, yes, absolutely. Um, and by the way, can I just say, there's a lot of you online here, and there's very few of you with your cameras on. It's very disconcerting to be looking at a blank uh, screen here. Come on, this is a club. In the club, you show your face, okay? So open your cameras, if, uh, so that, I mean, unless you're, you know, you know, I don't know, on the toilet or something, you know, obviously we understand. But, um, okay, so, so we, we give a talk explaining all of these things, but the answer to the question is, here is the criteria, guys. Five minute plus 150 test, do the press beyond. That's it. I mean, I know you expected half an hour discussion here, but honestly, that's it. You do the plus 150 test. If they pass, then you measure the spherical aberration. You put it into the software. You do the LASIK. If it's a cataract patient, or you have to make a flap. That's beautiful because it's a fresh, clean, virgin flap. And you're going to have no ingrowth issues whatsoever. If it's a post LASIK case, well, then you got to decide: was it what was it a microkeratome flap? What do the edges look like? What are the chances of ingrowth? Um, am I going to do a side cut only in the original um, microkeratome flap? Am I going to lift the microkeratome flap? Am I going to do an inside the you know a, a superficial flap inside the old microkeratome flap? That's super expert work. Don't recommend it if you're not really adept. Um, and you have to have high frequency ultrasound, really, to measure the flap in 3D. Um, unless you have a very thick flap, you can see out an OCT and you can confidently make the thinner flap on top of the old flap. So, you know, you got to do LASIK and, 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 and a, a very satisfying thing. And we, are, we make a good living out of this part is that we have patients who are coming from many other clinics. Because the UK has done 100,000 LASIK procedures per year since 2001. There's a lot of patients here with LASIK. And they find out about Presbyond. And they ask us if we can do it. And we're like, yes, you come under the therapeutic category. A therapeutic category, I'm sorry, is one slot. We have the same diagnostic criteria requirements for someone who had LASIK before and has no night vision problems as someone who comes in with terrible problems because we have a, a one-size-fits-all therapeutic analysis system which looks at night vision, contrast, glare, lateral glare, you know, on-axis um, um, uh, scatter, you know, OS, you know, OSI. We just want to make sure that if we're touching someone else's corneas that, that, that have been operated on somewhere else, that we're not going to get stuck with a problem that was not uncovered before the surgery. You know, we screen for ectasia big time using epithelial profiles. It's the only way, right? Um, so that's the simple answer to that. And then we have a number of examples here. Um, so here's an example, for example, uh, case, cataract surgery lens demonstration, um, case number three here, for example, um, okay, here we go. And so here's case number three. Oop, there it is. And I just have to um, pop this here. Okay, so case number three. Uh, the example of a 54-year-old who had blended vision two years ago here for a plus 125 with a standard setting for Presbyond, told that she had a little bit of cataract at the time, and this was what she had at the time. So a lot of surgeons would say, oh, oh, how can you not just take those lenses out? It was like, well, because, you know, because she's 53. I mean, you know, she knows she's going to need it, but we're going to take that risk when she takes that risk when she needs it because she came back now. She had she had perfect best corrected vision before, no night vision disturbances. So she comes back two years later, 
and now she's had a hyperopic shift in both eyes, and now her OSI has gone up. And we told her at the time that the advantage of doing the presbyon first is that you, you, you delay when you start aggravating your vitreous and your CME possibilities at your young age because your vitreous is attached, even though you're a small hyperope. And when the time comes, it could be one year, it could be 10 years, it may be sooner, maybe one, two, three years, then we do your cataract surgery with a monofocal IOL. The depth of field is already in your cornea from the presbyond, and you're going to have back to what you had in the first place. So she ends up, so pre-op, she was 2016, 2020 plus one. Her contrast was in normal range, okay? She comes back three months. She's seeing, you know, 2016. Uh, she's seeing 2016. Um, and six, she was slightly undercorrected, but her contrast was still good. She comes back two years post-op, loss of best spectacle corrected in both eyes, lots of loss of, of contrast in the left eye, a little bit of a loss in the right eye, and now she has progression, okay? Now she has a spoke straight across the middle of her left eye. Now is why she is not seeing well, no problem. Now her OSDI is really, really significantly raised at you know, she's minus a quarter, minus 1.5, but really high OSDI. That's a massive difference from the way she was when she first came in. And we calculate with some, because this is the next question that's going to come up. How do you do your calculations? The answer is Barrett Universal. Barrett Truquet Universal. Unbelievably robust calculator for presbyond post-cataract uh, surgery. Unbelievable. It's obviously calibrated for a well-proportioned amount of spherical aberration post-LASIK. I, I, I don't know how it would do with an eye that had Vizics in 1998 for a minus 7. That would be spherical aberration over the ears, and prop maybe the Barrett wouldn't do as well. But in a presbyon situation, the Barrett does phenomenally, incredibly accurate. And so... Which lens? Well, that depends on the spherical aberration, right? So as I said, you, you have your toxic amount of spherical aberration and you have your therapeutic amount of spherical aberration. You've also got your centration. So your, your spherical aberration has to be measured on the, on the cornea now because obviously the lens is going to be um, inside the eye. That's the one you're adding. And so it's the corneal spherical aberration that's going to be added to the lens aberration. So you know, we measure her spherical aberration here. Obviously, you pick a lens with a spherical aberration plus or minus that would help push the spherical aberration onto the target zone. So if the patient had a hyperopic ablation, they're going to have positive negative spherical aberration. And if they had a myopic ablation, they're going to have positive spherical aberration. And then you play with that either up or down, depending on where you are in the, in, in the scale. So you need your whole eye aberrometry coupled with your corneal aberrometry so that you can calculate what it is that you need to target as an internal aberrometry, okay? So in this case, um, we had plus 0.3, because it was a hyperopic ablation, remember? Plus 0.3 on the cornea. And so we're going to push that up a little bit by using the plus 0.14 lens. And that is going to give us plus 0.48, which is beautiful. It's right in the middle of the sweet zone for depth of field. And you know, the, the, these are the sort of basic lenses that we use that are essentially plain, uh, you know, uh, uh, monofocals with what we need. There's the aspherically neutral ones, there is the negative asphericity, and there's the positive asphericity lenses. Um, you know, of course, that like the 209, the 204 series, the higher the power, the more spherical aberration in the lens. So you, know, you have to know all that too. But essentially, that's how you choose the lens. So you preload preload it, and Bob's your uncle. This woman ended up um, 2016 and N4 
with a plano minus 0.75, minus 150, minus 0.5. This psyllin, this, she wasn't bothered by that psyll? Okay. If she was bothered by it, we would need to adjust it. Okay. So does that, does that answer that question uh, in, in, in part at least? Uh, the question about, okay, post-cataract. So I'm asked now about what about post-cataract doing, um, doing presbyond on top of that? And I'm looking for my um, example of that. It's not in this particular one here. It's in this one here. And this is a you know beautiful example. This one because you will see why in the end there's a there's a little uh, story at the end of this. I think if I show you the um, this case, um, case number two. Um, so this was a 68 year old male who was a jazz musician pianist healthy no medications everything fine single distance vision glasses only has worn glasses his whole life and uh, comes to me saying uh, I know you've operated on a lot of jazz cats uh, can you do my eyes? And I said, it would be my honor. He said, yeah, you know, I, I, the reason that I, I came to is because I actually I re realize I'm not seeing as well as I used to. And also, I'm not seeing up close as much as I used to. Okay. So he's 2050 best corrected in both eyes, and he's minus 7, minus 7, minus 8. And his topography looked great. And his lenses looked like little, uh, uh, like peanuts inside a little shell. I mean, he had these beautiful nuclear sclerotic uh, cataracts, 2050. He said, I said, well, you need cataract surgery. He said, I don't want cataract surgery. I'm like, yeah, but hold on a second. You have to have cataract surgery. There's, there's just no other way around this. Um, by the way, you're not legal to drive. He goes, but I use the glasses. He goes, no, even with your glasses, you're not legal to drive. So, you know, you're, you, you have to have cataract surgery if you want to continue driving. So he said, all right. Now, you know, obviously we ask everybody what they're going to do. And, you know, most of the world will do the lens surgery with a monofocal monovision. That's what most surgeries do. A good number of people who go to conferences and talk on podiums will do multifocal um, AT Lisa or some trifocal or something. But very few people um, will uh, put in presbyon, obviously, into the eye. But most people do monofocals. We know that. OK, so this is the explanation I gave the patient. I said, look, you know, you can have multifocals, but night vision, multifocal. Here's what I want to do for you. If you want to do what I want you to do, this is what you would do. You would have this surgery back in Florida with your own surgeon. So you can do that there and, and Medicare pays for it because you're over 65. Um, and your surgeon will be a little bit disappointed. He can't upsell you to a multifocal. He's just, you're just going to take the standard lens. But I'll explain to him what I'd like. And also, you're not going to see that well after the surgery. You'll see brighter with the glasses, but you'll be blurry. Less blurry than you are now without glasses, but still blurry. You're going to come back to me, and then we're going to make you as independent from glasses as possible. So I spoke to his surgeon. He was a bit puzzled as to why I would want the patient to be targeted to minus 150, to plus 150 in each eye. But he said, fine, if that's what you want to do. Go ahead. So he had the cataract surgery. He came back, and he came back pretty much on target. Thank you very much. Plus 175. Plus 150, thank you. That's very good. Well done. And now his best corrected was 2025 in one eye. His macula wasn't 100% on that side. Okay, well, that's the way it is. And his topography still looked fine. 
and uh, after the Yags, yeah, you know, not not the cleanest capsule I would I would like to see. But anyway, this is how I we this is how he was delivered back to me. At least he had crystal clear optics. So I planned presbyond enhancement on top of the cataract surgery. Okay, on top of these pseudophagic lenses, and in his case, I targeted minus one point six two five because I was. I was aware that his piano piano distance is about here, but he also wants to read. So you know this this is where monovision cataract surgery doesn't work very well, right? Because if I made him minus two twenty five to read, he wouldn't see his music, and if I made it minus one, you know, fifty to do the music, he wouldn't see up close. But in this case, it's presbyond on top of pseudophagia. This is what he looked like on post-op day one. You can see the, you can see here how beautiful the, 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 this ring is centered on his visual axis. And here he is for a post-op next summer when he came back for uh, on tour here playing at the Barbican. And he was uncorrected 2025. That's his best corrected of his right eye. And he was N4, like J2. And he was, you know, extremely happy. Okay, his inter, his intermediate vision was j2 binocularly so he literally was spectacle free seeing the audience reading tiny print reading music at, at, at you know music at, at, at intermediate super happy and who is this guy here is this guy this is chick korea and chick you know chick korea died uh three or four weeks ago right such a shame. Um, um, and um, and this, this is, he came in, you know, we had talked about how, you, you know, the adaptation of blended vision is going to feel a little bit strange for a while. You know, you, you basically are going to feel like your eyes are different. But with time, what's going to happen is you're going to feel like you just have one eye that sees everything. And if you do this, it'll be blurry. So don't do this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't do this. Don't do it. Okay. He's like, okay, got it. He came back the next morning from his from his hotel, and he and he and he, and he gave me for, literally. He tore off a piece of paper from a pad and gave me this, which is this this watercolor that he made for me. And um, this, I guess, this is the. He says, I, I just drew, I just painted it. I didn't know where it came from. Uh, he, here's the two eyes, and then it becomes the one eye that sees everything. Uh, and that's uh, Chick Corea. Thank, uh, yeah, wonderful little book. As for your pleasure and interest, as a small thank you, thank you for the new eyes. With love and admiration, Chick. Oh my God. You had no idea how I felt after I got that. But um, so I think I think that kind of answers your question about the interaction between presbyond and cataract surgery. And I and I, and I really think uh, I don't realize how important this was afterwards uh, until recently, because a huge part of the presbyond market is people that have already had LASIK. The other huge part of the presbyon market is those people that you already did cataract surgery on. Amazing, right? I mean, essentially, you don't have to do any marketing because you don't have to go internet or Google. You don't have to give money to anybody else. You go to your own database in your own clinic and you write to the patient and you say, I see that I prescribed some reading glasses for you five years ago after your cataract surgery. You know, I have a new technology which is, you know, spread around the world. It's, you know, it's being used everywhere and um, I, I've been getting fantastic results. If you'd like to come in for me to see whether I can, you know, make you more independent of reading glasses, I'd be, we'd be very welcome to, 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 to you'd be very welcome in the clinic for, for, for an evaluation. It's like, talk about easy, easy help. You're helping the patient. 
And it's what they it's exactly what they wanted you to do. They want you to call them and say, I still thought about you. I care about you. I invested in a new technology and I'm calling you because I think I can still I can make you even better. Yeah. So Cataract and Presbyond, previous LASIK and Presbyond, huge. You know. Um, what are the other question parts? Sorry. There's a few more questions on this topic. So okay. Okay. could you just go over again um, which IOL you use and how you choose which IOL? Right. And why you targeted um, hyperopia. Right. So I'm afraid this isn't like a full lecture on that. It's not a full lecture on that. It is a partial lecture on that. But I think it'll 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 it'll, it'll give us what we need. So essentially, um, hang on, wrong part here. There, okay. So, we're asking about IOL power after Presbyon. Okay, so obviously there's all these formulas and you can go to the ASCRS calculator and it's a one-stop shop. You put in your numbers in, they're all in there um, and you can compare and call, you know, what it, you know. Our experience is that the Barrett True K, if the spherical aberration if the spherical aberration is at, at a, at, in, in, in therapeutic range, not the toxic range, but it's in the therapeutic range, which is plus 0.6 to minus 0.6 AS, OSI, um, OSA, sorry, in a six millimeter zone. You remember the calculation zone has to be six. If you have that, then um, you can basically use the Barrett. Okay, so here we are. So um, oh, sorry, the, the slides weren't showing. So, so I know people develop preferences, and I, I, in fact, I'm, I, I have a colleague who's really experienced, and he's he's still using another equation. Um, but honestly, we are <laughs> we are. Tim, can you put up uh, the? I think you have the the six graphs of a, of an analysis of our cataract surgery accuracy. Uh, if you could find that while I'm talking, we can put that up there. Um, so, so the point here, I'll just go over this again. Remember that the spherical aberration, either positive or negative, increases the depth of field. So if you increase the positive spherical aberration, you will increase the depth of field. And if you increase the negative, it will increase the depth of field. But we know that beyond plus 0.6 or minus 0.6, you may not get increase in depth of field, and you may well get a decrease in depth of field and a decrease in contrast. Because now you're getting beyond the brain's ability to zoom through that spherical aberration. So you need to know the spherical aberration of the cornea because you're taking the patient's lens out and putting another lens in. So now the optical system is a combination of the corneal spherical aberration and the spherical aberration of the IOL that you're going to put in. Okay, that's going to be the total spherical aberration of the eye. Now, if you don't mind me complicating it slightly, if there's a large angle kappa, the spherical aberration of cornea is exactly on the visual axis, but the IOL spherical aberration is not going to be on the spherical on the, on, 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 the, on the visual axis. It's going to be in the bag, and the bag is off center. And the problem with aspheric lenses is that if you have spherical aberration in, in an IOL and you decenter spherical aberration, you induce coma. You can induce a bit of coma and patients don't notice it. In fact, there's an IOL that works by inducing coma. 
know, that, it's designed to give you coma. It's called the uh, oculentis. That's how it works. But when I say the, the, the plus 150 comfort works quite well for intermediate, but when you start using the plus three, you have much more complaints from the patients. So you can't have too much coma. You can only have a little bit. Okay, so back to this, you've got your spherical aberration on the visual axis, on the angle kappa. So the IOL might have a center here, and the spherical aberration of that IOL decentered, the spherical aberration goes down and the coma goes up. There's a, there's a seesaw relationship between spherical aberration and coma if you have an aspheric surface that is being decentered from the visual axis, okay? So the next step is to know what the spherical aberration of the cornea is. So you get the corneal spherical aberration from your topographer. Any topographer will do this for you, even the pentacam. Well, we'll give you a wavefront measurement. You have to make sure you set it to a six millimeter analysis zone so that your OSA measurement is calibrated to what we talk about in terms of plus six to minus 0 0.6. And if you're, if you really want to have the best toys on the planet, you go to CSO and you get the whole eye aberrometer from CSO, the Osiris which has 40,000 points, which is 40 times more resolution than the next best hartmann shack aberrometer, which is the eye design. And the next best is the Waska, so that's 800 spots. And you combine the two and register them inside one piece of software, like CSO allows you to, and you can calculate the internal aberrations. And you need this if you're gonna do topography guided treatments, but we're not doing that. We're talking about cataract surgery here. So the point here is measure the whole eye aberrometry, and you know that it's the corneal aber aberrometry that's important for this IOL calculation. And you want to add the IOL that's going to work together with the corneal spherical aberration to give you the whole eye aberration that you want. So this example that I showed, this eye had a plus whatever put into it, so it has plus 0.3 spherical aberration on the cornea. This eye has, sorry, we're going to put, that, that is a little bit low for depth of field. It'll work, but you can make it better by making the spherical aberration of the eye even higher. Sorry, this is a this was a minus treatment, obviously, to have a plus plus. Uh, hey, no one, no one, no one interrupted me there. Come on. So it's a this was obviously a, a myopic treatment, leaving plus spherical aberration. So in this case, we're not going to use a the technist minus 0.27 because that'll take away and make the spherical aberration less. And that's what Technus was telling you to do from the podium at the AAO 10 years ago. And that was like, I was sitting in the audience going, that's really stupid to make the spherical aberration lower. And they were like, oh, it's the best thing. They're gonna see the best. Yeah, they're gonna see the best on the moon. They're gonna see the craters on the moon, but they have no depth of field. So we would choose a positive spherical aberration IOL to increase the total spherical aberration into this more therapeutic range. So for example, if, if, the, if the cornea had minus 0.3, okay, I wouldn't use the plus 0.14. I would use a minus 0.18. You understand? If the cornea had minus 0.7 because it was treated on a Vizix. Then I would use a minus, sorry, I would try and reduce it to under 0 0.6. I'm getting all confused with my positives and minuses. Uh, mainly because it's, it is very confusing because the Malakara system that is inside the Presbyond is the opposite sign of the OSA. So it's, it's so, it's so annoying. 
Um, anyway, you, you get what I'm saying. Um, always try to optimize the whole eye serial collaboration with your IOL, okay? And get to know your IOLs. So it, we, we use basically the, the Zeiss bank here and, um, and there's no particular, by the way, it's not because I'm some big Zeiss guy, um, uh, because we're not. In the IOL side, we we bought our Upni 700. We, we're, we're just customers to Zeiss in the UK. We're not consultants. We don't have anything to do with that. But we but they have a good selection of minus spheric collaboration and plus spheric collaboration and no spheric collaboration lenses, right? So if someone has plus 0.5 or minus plus minus 0.5, great. Put the Lucia 409 MMP in because then you're not going to change anything and you're going to keep everything the way it is. If they had plus 0.7, you might put the minus 0.18 in to bring it below 0.6, minus 0.6. If they, you understand what I'm saying here, okay? You just tweak your spherical aberration based on what you have in the cornea. It's that simple. Um, and you know, the beautiful thing about this combination of presbyond and monofocal IOLs is that you are avoiding a patient coming in drawing this these things around. This is, by the way, this is an Osiris. Of a, of a symphony and we, you, I, I, I think you've all looked at a symphony in the slit lamp you can barely see the rings it looks so soft so innocuous oh this is going to be fine it's not like looking at an array lens where it literally looked like it looked like a lighthouse it looked like a fresnel lens practically and yet the aberrometer picks up all of these optical inc inconsistencies here um, so Tailoring the spherical aberration using monofocal eye wells is a great way to approach uh, your patients once you once you you have your um, your presbyon chops uh, up to scratch, as we say in, in jazz. It's like you got your chops, you got your chops ready. That means you're ready to play. Okay, so already mentioned uh, regarding this example. So I think I've answered all of that. Do you target planar? Oh. Oh, oh, why do I target plus? Ah, okay. So, okay. Clinically, we did not find, well, I have to say we did not analyze this formally. We did a retrospective analysis to look at whether the positive spherical aberration works better than the negative spherical aberration or vice versa. Now, if you talk to a wavelight user, they will insist that the negative spherical aberration patients are better than the positive spherical aberration patients because they're thinking about pupil size. If you have negative spherical aberration, that means that the smaller the pupil, oh shit, am, am I talking OSA or Malakara here? Uh, I was talking Malakara. Uh, Sorry, guys. If you have negative spherical aberration, that means that you've done a hyperopic ablation. In this case, as the pupil gets smaller, you get more minus refraction. If you have uh, more plus refraction, if you've done a myopic ablation, you have negative spherical aberration. As the pupil gets smaller, oh. <laughs> this is, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. All right, let's write it down. Negative, so my post myopic. Let's do this with everybody on board here. here here's the blackboard. We're in the teacher's um, in the teacher's office here. So 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 
So post myopic LASIK, they're going to have what kind of spherical aberration? OSA. Guys, someone unmute. Positive. They're going to have positive spherical aberration. Now, that means that post hyperopic, they're going to have negative spherical aberration. Okay? So, this means that, for example, so now, now what we're going to do here is make some examples. Let's say, for example, that post-op, the corneal spherical aberration was plus 0 0.31. Here's another example. The post-op spherical aberration was plus 0 0.82. Okay, so this is this one is after a low tre low myopic treatment. That's after a high myopic treatment. Okay, and here we're going to go the other way. Okay, this would have been a plus five or a plus four on a Visix with a no angle kappa, so it was centered on the on the pupil, but it was also on the visual axis. So what are you going to use for IOL? So, in this first case, Dan, since you're, you're unmuted already, what are you going to put into this eye? Um, I'll put into, the, in into, the, into this eye. An IOL with or first case positive. That's what you collect um, aberration. So you're going to put a little bit of plus spherical aberration in there. Yep. Like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's your IOL for this eye. And then what are you going to put in the other eye? One with um... negative to be less than 0 0.6. So for example, this one, right? Okay. And therefore, yep. without belaboring this, you're going to do the opposite on this side. Or, actually, you could even put in this one. I'm not mentioning any company names here, but, you know, that's the other, that's another option there, right? You, you know which one I'm talking about here, right? So, that's it. This is Presbyond combined with... Um, with IOLs. Now, um, why do we target hyperopia? Because there is an effect of the pupil. It might not be significant, but if you're going to choose one or the other, you might as well choose the one that might have a pupil effect, right? I mean, if you have a choice. You don't have a choice if the patient walks in the room and they're a myope. You don't have a choice. They're a myope. If you're a wavelight user, you used, I don't think they're doing this much anymore, but they, they were handing out these tables, telling people to push the Q slider to make the target Q minus 0.6, which was making a central island in the cornea, which is a multifocal cornea. And it works if you're perfectly centered and the patient is tolerant, but it's not a great idea. 
and I think they're finally understanding the lectures uh, and they're starting to copy what we're doing with Presbyon. It's not surprising. It's a good idea. It's not that complicated. Why wouldn't you copy it? But if you have a choice, you'd start, you'd start with negative spherical aberration so that the, when the pupil is smaller, there's more myopia, theoretically. Like I told you, we have a study that we did retrospectively where we didn't see much of a difference matching for spherical aberration in the near vision. But I think that's, you know, that wasn't a formal way of studying it. So we prefer to leave people with negative spherical aberration, which means it's better to target hyperopia post-op. And how much? Well, I guess it depends on how much spherical aberration is already in the cornea, right? If someone already has, let's say, um, let's say they already had plus 0 point, sorry, minus uh, 0.55, okay? Zero aberration. Yeah, let's say they already had minus 0.55 in the cornea because you treated a plus 5 in a 7 millimeter zone on a MEL, so they had no night vision disturbances, they had a lot of depth of field, um, and in fact in their plano eye, which is minus 0.55, they were seeing J5 because the spherical aberration was giving that to them right there and you and you and even with a large angical kappa because you put it on this you put everything on the, the exact visual axis you you would be you know er, the patient would be very very happy okay so you've got the cataract they got minus 0.55 in the eye on the cornea sorry so what am i going to do iol wise Zero. You could use a zero and target zero. Because, you know, if you get on zero, which you might, you know, it has it has been known to happen that cataract surgery lands on target. It does happen sometimes. Um, yeah, no problem. But if they are here, then you don't want to put a zero in because you could improve things for them, right? And the fact is, what, remember we talked about ex exactitude, um, having precision for blend division to work and have the most independence of glasses. If you're charging the patient premium prices, then you are going to try and give them the best possible result, not it's good enough, but the best possible result. So leaving them slightly hyperopic will allow you with a LASIK procedure to push them up further and to correct the cylinder perfectly and leave that eye smack on target like Chick Corea was. Okay? Um, I mean, someone pointed out, and I guess it's very, it's very true, that if you made the patient minus 1 or minus 150 in both eyes, you may never see them again. Because their optometrists make some glasses and they say, ah, I just put them on for driving at night. And now that patient is having dinner with some other people and says, um, oh yeah, uh, I had my cataracts done by um, Dr. Senecal and um, it's amazing. I can re yeah, I'm reading the menu without glasses and you're using reading glasses. And they go, really? Well, do you use glasses at all? I said, yeah, I use them for distance. Oh, okay. Well, that's not going to encourage me to go to Dr. Senecal at all. But if you're reading in the menu for your friends and they say, wait a minute, did you used to wear glasses? Yeah, no, I had my cataracts done by Dr. Senecal. But you're reading. Yeah. Would well, you use glasses for distance? No. What? You had uh, Everybody I know that's had cataract surgery has glasses for distance or near. Or lots of circles around lights at night. <laughs> One of the three, <laughs> you know. So anyway, you see what I'm saying is, is, is like it pays to be obsessional with every patient. Um, so if you leave patients myopic, their incentive to come back is also cut because they, they're like, ah, I don't want to do the extra surgery. If you leave them hyperopic, they can't see anything at any distance. You're, you're not disincentivizing them from having surgery. I thought that was a very astute business calculation from somebody from one of the courses. Uh, but 
Damn right. And it fits nicely with the fact that it's better to leave them hyperopic anyway because you get the negative spherical aberration story. Okay? Have I killed this? Have I, have I murdered this subject to death? Andre Moraldo, is there anything I missed on this? I know you're very keen on this. Not enough time to cover everything. <laughs> There's more? <laughs> we have another 15 minutes of, of, the, of, of the official time. Um, okay, um, so that's, that's that. Um, any other questions? Oh, are there any questions here? When treating a patient with hyperopia, what's your recommended treatment zone to avoid diameter, to avoid regression? Does everyone see that question there? Um, so I'll, I'll just put it here again. Um, so I'm going to answer this question. So um, I'm not, uh, uh, not going to call out names here, but the, here's the thing. Hyperopia is a subject which I know very dearly, um, uh, probably better than most, because I developed a lot of expertise in how to push hyperopia very, very, very high. Uh, and I will, I, I, I can, actually, Tim, could you um, post on here our plus four to plus seven with, with um, uh, epithelial mapping uh, onto here? Because if you, if you, please, if you read this paper, you are basically learning everything that we learned about about why hyperopic LASIK is different from myopic LASIK. Epithelial profiles versus Ks and optical zones. The answer is in Presbyond, and this is all covered in the course, which I recommend you take again. Um, if your hyperopia ablation is less than plus, th it's plus three or less, we recommend you treat in a 6.7 zone, program M, use S, and program an 8.1 or an 8.2 millimeter flap. So you've got a 6.7 millimeter zone with a transition up to 8.2, up to plus three. If you're treating above plus three, uh, can you post the, the actual file, the PDF here, Tim? If you, if, if, if you, if, if you're, if you're, if you're treating above plus three on the cornea, now is when you switch to a seven millimeter zone and you have to make a larger flap. So now you program L, use M, and program a 9.1 millimeter diameter flap. What you're going to get, see, with the, with the smaller zone, you get a little bit more overshoot. Like, so, so the, so the, 6.7 millimeter hyperopic plus three is going to be minus 0.5 on day one. The six points, the seven millimeter plus three would be minus a quarter on day one. You don't need as much overshoot. It regresses less, right? But remember, it's not regression. It's healing to the target. Regression would be they go to Plano by three months and they're at Plano at one year and they're plus 0.75 at two years. That's progression, which might be corneal or lens-based progression. If it's corneal, it's called regression, and if it's lens-based, it's called progression, okay? There, Tim's put the paper on there um, for everyone to download. Uh, but the beautiful thing about hyperopic LASIK is that if you use large optical zones, you get superb stability, and you get very good control of spherical aberration. This is something that Vizix, Nidec, um, um, uh, um, uh, well, mainly Vizix and Nidec, they never understood this well, and they got very bad results with hyperopia because they were using small optical zones with large transition zones instead of what they were supposed to do, which was to use large optical zones and large transition zones. Um, okay, so that answers that question. Um, when treating a patient with presbyon, okay, so those are the optical zones. So the answer is, oh yeah, so the flap, at, the flap is customized to the amount of hyperopia you're treating, and the zone is 6.7 if you can do a set M use S 8.1. It's, it's not a good idea to go below 6.5 in hyperopia. Now, there is an exception. 
And that is, and this is like, okay, this is outside of the Presbyon teaching. If you want to push the spherical aberration even higher, you do a six millimeter zone. But you can only really want to do that if you're doing a low hyperopic. So if you have a, uh, let's say you have a, a, a plus 0.75 patient and their spherical aberration is already minus, a little bit too much minus, and, you know, oh, sorry, a little bit too much plus, and you know that you, you're not going to get that in the, in the right range of minus with a 6.5 millimeter zone. So you, what you do is you go to the laser and you program a triple A in a 6. If you're really good at centration, you could even program it in a 5.75. And now you'll get more spherical aberration. But you've got to be careful about your centration. So you touched on the initial angle kappa, but you didn't go further with respect to patients with large angle kappa, which makes them less suitable for trifocal IOLs. Can you discuss further? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, well, Dan, how, how much have you used trifocals? I unfortunately do a lot there. You, a lot. I, I use panoptics a lot. You know, in my cataract patients, obviously, you know, I, I offer them the option. But as you say, similar to LASIK and Presbyon, centration with a trifocal lens is absolutely crucial. Right. So to use a trifocal lens, you need to center this lens over the actually sighted light reflex. You need to center panoptics. Um, so I use it not in presbyopia treatments necessarily, but in cataract patients. Yeah. Yeah. And if you center these lenses as well, you get 2020, 20, 2015 vision distance and near. If you decenter it and you're off target with your refraction, then it's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Be precise Beatrice, or you don't do it. Beatrice, you, you, you put a lot of trifocals in. Yeah. So centration with trifocals. Your, what's your experience there? So in my, in my experience, it's not the most important. It's very important, but it's not the most important. I have uh, any cases uh, that um, the, 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 the centration is not very, very good, very, and, and the, the, the visual, the side of the patient is, is very good with, the, with, the, um, with this IOL. IOL. So you, trifocal dial. So, so you don't feel that the centration is very sensitive with no, with, no, no. It, it, with with uh, at a at Lisa Lisa of uh, size. Yeah, yeah. It, It's not the most important because okay. if the centration is, is is the in the center of the pupil, uh, yeah. is is yeah. enough to have a, to have a good a good a good side. Okay, so so I, I love this because okay who okay online here we have um we have uh, fifty two people online here, um, so who wants to who wants to uh, be the judge here, okay, because you have two experts saying different things. How can both be right? How can both, I know how both can be right. I, I already, as she was speaking, I was thinking, ah, oh, oh, I know why. So why are both right? Anybody think about why both are right? It's most likely the spherical aberration of the lenses it's used. Well, you're both putting in, you know, modern trifocals. What's the difference between Beatrice, apart from her, you know, beauty and stuff in your ugly mug, um, apart from that, um, what's the difference? The, the difference is she practices in Madrid and you practice in Northern Canada. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference? The, yeah, the, the pupil, uh, yeah, yeah. Spanish yeah. pupils. Spanish yeah, pupils, yeah, yeah. Spanish pupils, yeah. 5.6, max. Max, yeah. Anglo-Saxon pupils, eight, okay. eight point five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's uh, it's discrimination. Yeah. Big difference. 
very different. Yeah. So, 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 Dan, your 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 Anglo-Saxon eyes with those blue eyes, with those pupils, just going whoa. I mean, look, we're we're at a lower latitude than you are, but because we're at, we're at the same latitude as Vancouver, but but you know, this kind of northern eye has a mean, at least in the UK, the mean the mean scotopic pupil is 6.33 in our practice. That's the mean. 50% are bigger. And that would be like the biggest pupil you can find in, in, in Madrid. And that's after, you know, a couple Maybe. of, line, <laughs> yeah, couple yeah, of yeah. Line, lines of cocaine. That's about as high. That's about as wide. Well. Maximum is maybe 6.5. Six, six it's 6 in, in. No. So I think, so that's an interesting. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing. I think if the patient has small pupils, the significance of the centration of the IOL becomes less less uh, critical. Uh, it's still critical because if you're if your if your axis is going through the wrong place of the lens, you're you are screwed. Uh, somebody wants to say something. Somebody wants to say something. Hello, I heard a. I heard a... to discharge my. Yeah, but should I take it from the case or? Sorry, can, can you? Uh, on, is that okay? Can you switch your? Charging, charging, charging. It's fine. I'll leave it like that. Okay. Can you switch your video on so that we can um, hear what you're saying? Okay. Well, all right. Uh, I think maybe she wasn't talking to us. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, Kenneth, oh my God, Hong Kong. Are you logged in from Hong Kong now? What time is it there? Oh my God. <laughs> That's why you're not switching on your video. You're in your pajamas. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Oh, you're in the toilet. Oh, you actually are in the toilet. Okay, fine. Okay. So, so he's brushing his teeth while we're doing this thing here. Okay. Uh, um, any IOL recommendation for a patient with previous intracore? Oh. Whoa. Intracore. Whoa. Yes, monofocal all the way. Okay. Those intracores are multifocal corneas. And that is really, and, and if that is not centered on the visual axis, this patient is not a happy camper. Do you all remember this was a concentric rings creating a controlled ectasia in the center of the cornea, a little, little ectasia bump? It's like a, it's like a Presby Max. It's like a, it's like the Visix um, Presby LASIK. It's a central island, basically. It's like the wave light minus 0.6 in a minus five central island. It's, it's, it's a central island. So Ken, what I would say with this is if, if this is not well centered or if the patient has, if they have a cataract, you can't really assess the vision or the contrast, but I would say that it might be worth considering, well, first of all, get an epithelial map. Um, well, that's only the, I think that's only the second time I've said that in an hour and a half. That's a record. I would normally have said it about 50 times already. So you get an epithelial map and you need to check just how big that mountain is in the middle of the cornea. Because if you see a, a 15, 20 micron central island that's being compensated for by a lot of epithelial change, it might be worth in this patient do, doing a trans epithelial PTK to reduce that central island to improve the optics of that cornea before you do anything else on this patient. Uh, and I would use a monofocal, absolutely a monofocal. Um, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a tough one. Um, these super cores, super cores and Presby maxes, uh, you know, these, these, these central line and, and the wave light Q slider hype, presbyopic treatments they these are the three corneal presbyopic treatments that gave presbyond a, such a difficult time to take off because everyone put presbyond in the same box 
has those three things. And it's a totally different treatment. It's another planet, like I always say. It's the three planets. It's like another planet. It's multifocality on the cornea. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, all right. Well, um, how many in the audience also do smile? And do you do monovision smile? And you do you do monovision smile instead of presbyond? And why? That's a question. Anybody want to speak about that? Go on, Yaron. Uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, hello, to everybody. Um... Yeah, so I'm um, if I'm performing um, smile treatments, it, uh, I think it depends um, most on the age. If I have a for for example a 43 year old patient which is starting like uh, to recognize that he has problems with um, um, his contacts and near vision, then I would um, also think about or, or, or recommend more a smile treatment with a minus 0 0.5 instead mm -hmm. of Presbyon so early at an earlier age. Right, they're getting older from 40. 647 if they already have like um, if they already tolerate minus one diopter in the non-dominant eye then i would say this is a switch to use a presbyon system okay before i would use a smile with a slight my uh, myopic monovision good good i i okay a anybody else want to comment Because I, I I have things to say, but I don't want to hog it up here. Anybody no, else? I, I do the same, Dan. You know, I, I perform smile, but it's usually pre press pre press biops. I would if I treat a myopic patient that that still has pretty good accommodation when yeah. they're between forty and forty five, they can still read J two uncorrected uh, with their distant correction. I know they're going to become press biopic soon enough. Right. Right. Well, Blur and I would then um, perform most likely smile and leave them with that amount of, of micro mono vision. Right. Uh, but the challenge is these guys get older and then they might need an enhancement on top of what you've left them with. The 0.5 might last only a few years. Right. So the majority of my patients, I would still offer press by press by on explaining to them you can tolerate now 0.5, but in three or four years, you might need an enhancement to enhance your near vision. And then if you can't do a, a circle procedure or your cap is too thick and stuff like that, then you need LASIK in anyways on top of your smile. Right. The, remember, it's, remember. Yeah. Yeah, remember, it's the, you're very lucky you came in now talk, right? Instead of it's like, it's like, oh, it's so good that you came in now. Why? Better now than five years from now. Why? because you don't tolerate the full blend. And anyway, you only need half the blend now. So now you can have everything. And when you need the full blend, you'll be able to tolerate the rest because you've already tolerated half. If you came in five years from now, you would only tolerate half the blend. So you'd only have half the near vision. Okay, so that's the, that's the you're lucky you came in now speech. But so both of you are, are saying similar things to what I would say, and I would add a little bit more. So one of the things that I measure, we measure in these cases, these young presbyopes, the 41 year olds, the 42 year olds, we measure the amplitude of accommodation. OK, so, you know, it's it's a very complex, expensive device here, uh, and you just measure the amplitude of accommodation. And this tells you a lot. If a 42 year old has four diopters of accommodation, it's coming. If they have eight and a half diopters of accommodation, they have a few years to go. And so that tells you, at least gives you a little bit of a gauge. Of course, it's, it's not predictable, but it gives you a gauge. The second thing I would say is, 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 is it, and you can remember this, um, Presbyond has two aspects to why it is, has depth of field. One of them is spherical aberration, and the other one is the epithelial profile. So the epithelial profile is a fills is a filling in of this of the trough of spherical aberration. So the topography looks completely smooth, but internally there is a ring of epithelium. And 
you heard it from me, and I'm, you know, everyone says, oh, you're so, you're so against multifocality. It's like only if it doesn't decrease contrast. And this epithelial lens doesn't decrease contrast, but it does increase depth of field. In fact, the patent for Presbyond is on the epithelial profile, and we have that from Zeiss. We, we, got, we got the patent, uh, you know, many years ago. So that's, that's why Presbyond is better than Smile Monovision. Now, the intersection range is where SMILE has the advantage over LASIK, and that is for very high myopes, right? So remember that spherical aberration, you induce less spherical aberration for the same zone with a SMILE than with a LASIK. So if you have a minus 7.5 or a minus 8, you will induce less spherical aberration with the smile than if you did LASIK. So in this case, a monovision smile procedure will induce the correct amount of spherical aberration. Now, why is it still Presbyond? Because Presbyond is not just software. Presbyond is a system. It's the system of marketing it, doing the plus 150 test, titration if you require it, doing the surgery, and then managing the small refractive errors and being able to diagnose the small refractive errors required to make the patient happy. That's the system of Presbyond. So if you just substitute SMILE for LASIK, as long as the spherical aberration is going up properly, they're kind of similar, except for you don't have the epithelial lenticule, but you do have a similarity. So you're going to ask me now, how high is, this, is the myopia that you have to do before you get the proper spherical aberration? And sadly, SMILE is so damn good at avoiding spherical aberration that you have to be treating well above minus 6 for it to be similar to Presbyond. So most patients, it's going to be better to do Presbyond than SMILE. So then the next question you're going to ask me is, what about developing Presbyon for Smile? And I'll say, that's a secret. But because we're all in the club, I can tell you, it's a few years off, but we are developing it. It's complicated. It's actually very complicated because Smile doesn't induce a lot of spherical aberration. So we, ha we have to use a, w a way of inducing spherical aberration that we did not use before and we've never used. So it's now, it's actually, at a, at a, we're having to do something clever um, with it. And uh, we tried everything. We tried using smaller zones with smile. Would that work? And the answer is no. Smile is just too good at inducing spherical aberration that you can't do Presbyond with it below minus six and a half or minus seven. So, so remember, a smile monovision is like Presbyon if you have the system around it. But I can tell you because we do we do do smile Presbyon if we have to. If a patient has you know a poor ocular surface with respect to LASIK, but okay for smile, you know those patients, right? There's a, there's a certain bracket of patients that you'll you, you'll be fine doing smile. But I don't know, LASIK, I don't think so. You know that bracket? Women, postmenopausal, late 50s, Botox, lip fillers. You understand, it's just like, oh, you know, the, the eyelid's a little bit tight from that blepharoplasty. There's a little bit of exposure. That patient, ah, smile is better, you know? Let's not aggravate the situation here with the LASIK procedure. So. In those cases, we do smile monovision, and, I, and, and our experience is that they don't have the depth of field. So those patients don't have the same effect that we get with Presbyon, which is this continuous focus from here. I mean, I'm in, look, look at this. I mean, I'm, this is, I'm serious here. I can see J1 here. Now, I don't know. That, what is that like? 10 centimeters and I can and it's it's completely in focus in completely in focus and well now it's getting a little small 
it's in focus, but it's too small. Okay? <laughs> we have this continuous vision with Presbyon. And with, with monovision, those are the patients that say, my intermediate's not right. Or, you know, and, and, and that's, so you, you, you know, you're on, you're absolutely right. You know, if you want the best independence from glasses, Presbyon is better. If your myopia is very high, you can consider smile because you've got the advantage of more spherical aberration and a little bit less than LASIK, which can be an advantage. A minus eight LASIK, it's very hard to keep the spherical aberration in control. Um, it oft, I mean, often it will go in, in our Presbyon minus eights, it would go to plus 0.7 or plus 0.75 or a little bit high. And many patients are okay. And some patients are not. And you have to do a topography guided to push that down again. You understand? Wow. Um, can, well, we have to go, but can we do Presbyon on smile patients? Then I'm just interrupting. Sorry, I need yeah. to leave. You I'm too, not... yeah. Well, uh, you, Abdel, um, if you've done smile on someone and made them plano, and you, you use the protocol, which is to 135 cap, Yes, you can measure their spherical aberration. You can make the 100 micron flap. You can program the presbyond and do presbyond. Yes. And with that super specialist question from Abdel, and by the way, you need to present that case that you sent me the other day when, uh, at the next club, because that's an interesting case. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And uh, I hope that uh, that was fun. We will try to have these once a year. Yeah, once a year. Uh, sorry, once a month, once a month. God, I got my pluses and minuses wrong and I'm getting my years and months. Away. I might be losing it. Um, hopefully I will not be completely uh, demented by next month's uh, date. We will, send a, we will send a date for you as a reminder for the next, uh, the next club date uh, uh, shortly. So thank you very much. And please leave feedback on the Facebook page and here we are. And, and remember, we have the new we have the course online if you want to look at the November course again, or you can take the course in June because we're going to do the course live again with you know the little upgrades. And we have the course in Spanish because um, Beatriz and her colleagues um, were very kind to listen to me for, for 22 hours uh, trying to give the same course in, in Spanish. It took me like six hours too long. But anyway, there we are. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Happy Easter. Happy Hanukkah.